All right, Julie, today, stay with us. I want to introduce some other special guests that we have with us tonight. Civil rights attorney, former Court TV anchor, my co-anchor, my friend Lisa Bloom is with us. Also, retired municipal court judge, uh, the Honorable Lynn Toller is with us as well. You know her from TV for many, many years. Great to have everyone here. Great to see you again. Uh, Lisa, what do you think of the defense taking what I always thought were the worst part of their case, these bystanders who were witnessing all of this, and trying to turn that into the explanation for the actions of Derek Chauvin? Well, I think it just goes to show how desperate the defense has to be. Are you kidding me? First of all, any of us who live in a city would consider that number of bystanders to be a very small number of people. What are we talking about? 10, 12 people? Uh, they weren't screaming. They weren't yelling. They were pointing out that George Floyd had become motionless and that he should get his knee off of George Floyd's neck. This is something we would want a bystander to do in any situation where somebody is being abused as George Floyd was. So give me a break. I've heard of blaming the victim, blaming the bystander. I mean, that's a whole new level. Judge? I'm right with you. I'm right with you on that. And I, I have to say this for the defense counsel. He didn't have much to work with. He's got nine minutes and 29 seconds of his client doing what he did uh, videotape from very all different kinds of angles. But the absurdity of the argument is to say that he was distracted by people pointing to the thing he says he was distracted from. Do you know what I mean? It's like saying, I didn't see the apple because everybody was telling me hey, there's an apple and pointing to it. It just, it's just an absurd argument. Okay. So, you know, during the opening statement for prosecutors, uh, Jerry Blackwell uh, talked about the bystander, and there was one moment that really uh, stuck out to me involving Chauvin and, and some mace. And let's take a listen first, and then we'll take a look at it. A member of the Minneapolis uh, Fire Department who was trained in administering first aid and emergency care, she's going to come and talk with you. Her name is Genevieve Hansen. She wanted to check his pulse. She wanted to check on Mr. Floyd's well-being. She wanted him to let up and get up. She did her best to intervene, to be able to act, to intercede on George Floyd's behalf, and you'll be able to see for yourself when she approached Mr. Chauvin on top of George Floyd with both of his knees, reached for his mace in his belt, and pointed in her direction. So she couldn't help. She'll come and talk with you about that experience. All right, Julie Janae, let's take a look at that video. This is the bystander cell video of, of Chauvin uh, going for that mace. And as we take a look, I mean, to me, this is a, a big deal. I mean, because this was one of the bystanders who was uh, approaching. And I guess when she sees the mace, she backs up at that time. If you blink, you'll miss it, but it is a very animated part of the video. Genevieve Hansen is an EMT off-duty firefighter there in Minneapolis. She's trying to tell these officers her credentials, but you see Derek Chauvin grab his mace, shake it, and then point the, I don't know if he's pointing the mace, I won't say that in her direction, but he's holding it up in a way that she realizes that she needs to get back something that the state says she's going to testify about when she takes the stand. And right there, we see it in his left hand. Uh, uh, Judge Toller, how about that? Um... Not only do we see it in his left hand, we also see behind him where there's nothing but cars. So that, that disabuse you of the notion that, you know, there was a gathering crowd. I think he got committed to the proposition of not being told what to do. And, and that was the most important thing to him. He was committed to the proposition that he was not going to be instructed by the crowd, and he allowed that to overtake everything else that he was doing. You know, Lisa, as I, as I watch this video, and, and she's the one, she's an EMT. She works for the fire department. She's yeah. been trained in all this, is saying that. Um, and, and she's very disturbed by what she sees. Yet Chauvin wants no part of it. How, how does this play when she testifies? I, th I think the jury is going to be very yeah. interested in her take on all of this. This is so heartbreaking to watch because in the middle of all of this, of course, is George Floyd. And you see him there getting killed. You know that this ends with him dying. And here these bystanders are, thank God, 
speaking up for a stranger, trying to do something, as I would hope anybody would, the defense is trying to distract from what we all know is true, that in my opinion, clearly this was a murderer. And by the way, I represent three Black Lives Matter protesters who were at the protests days later, and they were victims of police violence. Police violence is a major problem in this country, especially against African Americans. That's what's going on here. That's what the bystanders see. That's why they stop. That's why they take their cameras out because this is a long, sad story in American history. And they decided they had to document it. They had to try to intervene. And thank God that they did. Donald Williams is one of those bystanders. He testified today. He'll continue testifying tomorrow. Let's take a listen. At the moment, I was the most vocalist person out there pleading for Floyd's life because I felt like it was definitely in a room. And um, there was, at one point in time, a medic came on scene and she spoke on checking pulse what made me even go even more harder because I heard it and then I registered in it like oh you do need to check his pulse oh he is not moving like oh you just killed this man you know and so her expertise was like look he's fading away you need to check his pulse she's asking him multiple times I'm asking him multiple times no one checked his pulse Julie, today, um, Donald Williams, a, a very, another interesting bystander that is there because he has a background that also became very relevant to what was happening to George Floyd. It can give you an idea of why the defense wants to go after the bystanders because they are some of the strongest witnesses that are going to be called to the stand. Donna Williams having this specialized martial arts background. He was so descriptive today in telling this jury about how he felt when he was there on the scene, what he was observing through the eyes of someone who understands choke hold, giving them names like a blood choke and a shimmy uh, motion. He said watching George Floyd die was like watching a fish in a bag as his eyes went, rolled over and he was no longer moving and was lifeless. He talked about the fact that he was at the door of the Cup Foods and walked away from it, never going into the store, realizing there was bad energy and it stopped him from even being able to go into the convenience store. Yeah, Lisa, for me, the first time I watched the, the video and, and heard the voice of Donald Williams, that's what really stuck with me the most because what he was seeing was so obvious to him. And he's, he's speaking directly at times to Chauvin, yet there's no, there's no reaction other than a, a, a glare is what he said. Right. And this is the prosecution closing argument, I think, which is this isn't like Chauvin you know, tripped and fell, and for one second there was a mistake and there was the knee on the neck. This was more than nine minutes. How many seconds in each minute? How many times did bystanders tell him that what he was doing was wrong? How many times does another officer say, let's roll him over? And Chauvin says, no, we're not going to do that. He had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to save a man's life, and he refused to take it. And that is murder. Judge, it, it, you know, in, in criminal trials, we always see defendants um, you know, point the finger in other places for different reasons. Uh, right now, it looks like the finger's going to go at the bystanders. Um, there's going to be a cross-examination tomorrow of that man, Donald Williams. Uh, how do you think that's going to go? Do you, how aggressive do you think the defense will be with someone who was merely a bystander? I think they will be pretty aggressive because they're in a lot of trouble. It, it, it is, it's unfortunate for their client that that witness had so much relevant information and knowledge and background about exactly what was occurring in the moment. There was no need to, you know, call an expert witness. And I almost felt when I was first listening to him, are they qualifying him as an expert? Because he knew so much about what was happening that day that just simply elevates his ability to be a knowledgeable witness. And I think if they don't go after him, if they aren't tough on him, if they don't call them out about something or other, they're, you know, they're losing whatever small chance they have of muddying the picture enough to uh, let that nine minutes and 29 seconds not be what it is. All right. Uh, Julie Janae, we're going to check back with you at the top of the hour. Lisa Bloom, Judge Toller going to stand by. We're going to take a look at 
Some other big moments from this day one of the case against Derek Chauvin, the man accused of murdering George Floyd. Mr. Chauvin continues on as he had, knee on the neck, knee on the back. You'll see that he does not let up and he does not get up. You will see that he does not let up and that he does not get up. Same position, doesn't let up and you'll see he doesn't get up. Still does not let up, doesn't get up. You're going to hear and see that there were any number of bystanders who were there who were also calling out to let up and get up. That there was a duty to have administer care to let up and get up, uh, you will learn. She wanted him to let up and get up. Only then does Mr. Chauvin let up and get up. An absolute theme that was throughout the one hour that Jerry Blackwell presented his opening statement today. I mean, well done. I mean, well done. The guy knows his way around the courtroom. Uh, let's bring back in Lisa Bloom and uh, Judge Lynn Toller, who are with us. Um, how about that theme, Judge? Does not let up, does not get up, does not let up. That's to me. Uh, do you like it? Do you not like it? It was extraordinary. I loved his opening. That, he me too. started out with making intimacy with the with, with with the jurors by talking about COVID and, and and kind of showing why there's a restriction and not that connection. And then he begins by saying. He was at odds with the code of a police officer, not putting it between people versus the police or blue lives and black lives. He, 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 he phrased it so well, and it was like everything was a verse for these minutes, and he didn't let up or get up. And then he did those for these minutes, and he didn't let up or get up. And then he pulls out the part about uh, the duty of care that was not met. I mean, it was an extraordinary opening. And I know some people say that it wasn't passionate enough, but if you're that good, and you're that tight, and you do it so well, I don't think you need a whole lot of movement and action with it because that was a spectacular open. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and you know, th that little refrain is something that I'm sure yeah. we're going to hear in the closing, and, and, and the jurors may take that into the jury room with them. Uh, Lisa Bloom, I want to play for you the way uh, prosecutors opened this whole thing by, by elevating... Uh, uh, Chauvin and, and what his duty was as a police officer. You're going to learn in this case a lot about what it means to be a public servant and to have the honor of wearing this badge. It's a small badge that carries with it a large responsibility and a large accountability to the public. What does it stand for? It represents the very motto of the Minneapolis Police Department, to protect with courage, to serve with compassion, but it also represents the essence of the Minneapolis Police Department approach to the use of force against its citizens when appropriate. The sanctity, a sanctity of life and the protection of the public shall be the cornerstones of the Minneapolis Police Department's use of force. Symbol of public faith, ethics to police service, sanctity of life, all of this matters tremendously to this case because you will learn that on May 25th of 2020, Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force up on the body of Mr. George Floyd. Lisa Bloom, I saw you nodding your head as you were watching all that. Uh, to me, the amazing part of it is, is, is this is a case against a police officer, and he's elevating the status of officers, but also their duty at the same time. I thought it was very effective. I thought the prosecutor did a great job. But, you know, the one thing that nobody's talking about in this courtroom, and it was the same thing in the Trayvon Martin case, the trial of George Zimmerman, and that's the issue of race. Race permeates this case, but nobody wants to talk about it. There's no question in my mind that Mr. Chauvin 
put his knee on George Floyd's neck and held it there for more than nine minutes because he had certain perceptions about George Floyd on account of his race. George Floyd was perceived by him to be. Isn't that a little dangerous, though, really Lisa? Was. Can't that be a little dangerous? Because you then you're going to say that you got to prove it. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the studies are overwhelming that especially large African-American men are perceived to be hostile and threatening when they're not. And George Floyd... Well, you're not going to have that evidence, are you? You're not going to have that evidence. What was he accused, of? You're not gonna have that he accused of, Vinny? He was accused of passing a fake $20 bill, a nonviolent crime. We don't see any violence on his part. What is the justification for a knee on his neck? Do you think that would have happened to a white guy? Why is there so much police violence against African-Americans? It's because of these false perceptions of criminality and aggressiveness. And this case is the perfect example. Why did it ignite the it's nation? It's an example, but you world? can't say that because in your opening. George judge, I need a ruling by the judge here, Lisa. Judge, can you, can you put that in your opening statement? Because your opening statement, no, you got to put what you're going to prove. It, yeah, I think it would be a mistake. His job is to prove that Chauvin did what he did. And I think that the, when you raise the issue of race, and I think everything she said is true. I've got six black sons. They've all had negative experiences with the police unprovoked. I, I, and I get all of that. But his job is to convict this guy. And if you start making it just about a racial issue, you better have good evidence of it that you can prove. You can't just throw it out there and not prove it. And then you don't want to bring in the static that that occurs in the jury room when you have enough without it. So why raise something that you can't easily demonstrate and, 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 and potentially harm your case, even though it's true? We all know it's right. true. And, but we listen, want I th Derek to go to jail. We do. And I think it's it's like the toxic third rail that you got to be careful when you touch right. it. And you do have to prove it. But why else? Why else was that knee on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes? Why did he think he was so threatening, even for, I think, four minutes after George Floyd stopped moving? It's because of his perceptions about George Floyd as a black man. And I have no doubt about that. I think the entire country agrees with me, which is why we all took to the streets afterwards. All right. I want to get to Eric Nelson's opening statement, which was um, slightly different in style. But there was one major point that he made that's going to be the foundation of the defense. And I think... Uh, the biggest problem for prosecutors. Let's take a listen. The re results of Mr. Floyd's toxicology screen revealed the presence of fentanyl and methamphetamine, among other things. And it will be important to know the difference between fentanyl and methamphetamine. The autopsy revealed many other issues, including coronary disease, an enlarged heart, what's called a paraganglioma, which is a tumor that secretes adrenaline, swelling or edema of the lungs. And the state was not satisfied with Dr. Baker's work. And so they have contracted with numerous physicians to contradict Dr. Baker's findings. This will ultimately be another significant battle in this trial. What was Mr. Floyd's actual cause of death? The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body, all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. All right, cause of death is an element of all three crimes that Derek Chauvin has been accused of. They've got to prove it beyond any and all reasonable doubt. And uh, Lisa Bloom, the state here has contracted with other experts. The medical examiner from Hennepin County, not a home run. There are some things that he said that uh, could raise a reasonable doubt in and of themselves including a statement that if he didn't have any other information and was just going by the autopsy, he would have ruled this an overdose. That and would be a, a break. That's this Dr. Baker same, for the state. This was the same thing we saw with Eric Garner in New York, another large African-American man killed by police. And they said the defense was, oh, well, there were other factors. I mean, you mean to tell me that the knee 
on the neck was not the cause of George Floyd's death, that just coincidentally, all of his other medical conditions that he's lived with his entire life into his 40s, coincidentally, right at that moment, that's when they choose to kick in and kill him. I think it's preposterous. I think it's an insult to our intelligence. Well, they're, they're going to present evidence as well, Judge, of... Uh, they're going to say George Floyd was ingesting speed balls, which is methamphetamine and fentanyl combined. They say they've got a, one of those pills with his DNA on it that was found uh, partially uh, chewed in the back of the cruiser. Uh, they're going to show a video of a little white dot on his tongue. They're going to bring in the 2019 arrest where he's ingesting drugs as police approach. Uh, is this a viable, reasonable alternative? They don't have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They just have to raise a reasonable doubt. I think that's their best strategy going forward. That said, they are trying to uh, couch it in terms of the crack epidemic. You know, blacks, the cracked up, hyped up big black guy, as opposed to the 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 opioid crisis that is now decimating uh, a whole a whole portions of the United States of America. So that, that that's trying to buy into that notion. But I, you know, uh, he was not going to live to be 95, but he didn't have to die that day. And the reason that he died that day is because of what happened to him there on the street. And you take your victims as they come. You know what I mean? You shouldn't have to be a built like a Marine to survive a non-threatening police encounter. All right. The final uh, big contrast in the opening statements today is you have a prosecution team of 14 attorneys. Three of them will be uh, speaking at different times to this jury. But they had a very well-polished PowerPoints, pictures, videos, timelines, incredible graphics. It's like they hired the court TV graphics department to help with this opening statement. Whereas Eric Nelson, he's kind of like Columbo. He just shows up by himself. He's got one helper in the back, but he's going to be the only voice. As we look side by side at the uh, uh, two uh, different styles that were presented today, uh, what do you think's better in front of a, a, a jury judge? The, the, the polish, the PowerPoints, the bells and whistles, or just a guy who shows up to tell you a story? You know, he had a power, the prosecutor had a PowerPoint, he had bells and whistles, but he also just showed up and told a story as well. He did everything the defense did and then some. He didn't rely solely on that. If you didn't see that PowerPoint, if you just heard his words, they were nonetheless compelling and convincing. So it's not one versus the other. He's just got stuff in addition to his ability to tell a good story because he already has. All right. And Go ahead, Lisa. We have like 15 I, I seconds. Just gotta say, yeah. So Vinny, you know, in my law firm, we represent the underdogs and it's always one or two of us against a cast of thousands of attorneys on the other side. Juries don't like that. They relate more to the underdog. One or two attorneys, that's all you should have in the courtroom. Uh, I can't believe Lisa Bloom is ever an underdog. Anyway, uh, Lisa Bloom, <laughs> great to see you again. Judge Toller, great to you see too, you Vinny. again as well. Great to see you. Appreciate Hi, Judge. you. Judge, good to see you. Please come back. Please come you, back and, and help us uh, uh, through this trial uh, together. We appreciate it. All right, folks, uh, still ahead.